a long time ago I concluded that the people who are drawn to do accompaniment, protective accompaniment of people who's, of other people far away whose lives are threatened, that that works strong, uh, draws very strong personalities. And um, Joe is definitely a strong personality. <laughs> He, um, the, when he, he began service on the team in July of 2003, and at that point in, um, in October of 2002, we had not been able to replace our team. And a few weeks after the, the team left, there was an incursion into La Union by paramilitaries, and a young man was, was abducted and, and disappeared. And so, uh, when Joe began in 2003 with two other people on the team, he was sort of like, they were like starting a new team. You know, they were, it was almost like they were starting a whole new project. And there was a kind of a snafu where they were, um, they were flying uh, to, to Bogota on July 4th, on 4th of July. And there had been a lack of of confirmation of their ticket. So they got to the airport and there was no ticket. And um, his two young companions, I mean, we were all upset. They called me, <laughs> like, what the, what is going on here? You know, like, what are you gonna do? And there was a moment where Joe was just about to call it quits. He was just right on the edge. You know, there was that like teetering moment. And I said, okay, we're gonna get the ticket, we're gonna get you the ticket, we're gonna pay the money, we'll figure it out. And he, he stuck with it. And not only did he stick with it in that, I mean, when they, when they went there, there were three of them, and there was a, um, a small building that had uh, two small bedrooms that, that was the, ha the house for FOR. So there wasn't enough for the three of them. And Joe was put up in, a, in, the, in the bodega, the, the, uh, the sort of the central building that was owned by a family, in a, in a little room with a doorway about that high. <laughs> and you know, he, and then his two young teammates became lovers. <laughs> and so he had, a, he had kind of a hard time with it. And he was, at the end of the six months, I think even before the end of the six months, he was, again, kind of ready to, like, call it quits. You know, it was just, it was a hard time. The security issues were very intense. It was very hard to figure out what was going on, partly because we were a new team. And then the community said to him, we want you to stay. And that, that shifted it for him. It took it just, just, just like that, boom. He said, no, okay, I'll, I'll stay. And he, um, he not only stayed, he then also worked in our committee. He was a member of our committee, which oversaw the whole project and, until he died. And um, he, you know, at the beginning, we only had, in Colombia, of 45 million people, we had a team in this tiny, rural, endangered community. And so our um, experience and perspective on Colombia as a whole, but particularly all the experiences of nonviolent resistance and other communities, was very limited. I mean, partly just physically, they, they, were, they had to be there a lot of the time. And um, so, he, he was part of a process in which that project expanded so that we could accompany other communities and, and organizations. And including, uh, you know, we visited these two communities here that are shown here, but we also began to, always, you know, while he was part of our committee, we set up a, a team in Bogota. And shortly after the, the presence was set up in Bogota, there was a massacre in San Jose de Partelo. And Joe was there. Uh, I mean, he wasn't accompanying at the time, he was visiting. Um, and 
I really appreciated his always having, and you heard it in his writing, that vision beyond this one community. He connected it. He connected this rural peasant experience in a tiny place in Colum the mountains of Colombia with all these other forces that they were resisting but that we need to resist too. And um, so I want to say something this evening about um, U.S. policy because he was very supportive of that part of our work that on the one hand we have this presence on the ground in, in a conflict zone with people who are resisting violence but we're also uh, working against these these policies that are that are making a lot of it happen and you know we're kind of in a conflict for with the Department of State <laughs> and um, I'm hoping for more company in that. Um, so I, I want to say some things about why. Um, last night I watched a Colombian news program called Noticias Uno, in which um, a young soldier, professional soldier, talked about when he was in the department of Vichada, which is in eastern Colombia, not that far from the Venezuelan and, and Brazilian borders. And this, he was there up until recently, and in 2007 and 2008, um, the battalion that he was a part of made a deal with the number one drug trafficker in Colombia in order to protect their shipments, a guy named Cuchillo the knife. And um, he, the, the uh, man was being paid uh, $350 per, per shipment. And this battalion was also killing civilians and counting them as guerrillas killed in combat. This is a, a phenomenon that's known as false positives. Because the army has been measuring its success by kills just like the U.S. did in Vietnam. So the more guerrillas you kill, the more success you have. And this was from the top on down, from President Woody on down. And so the, this was even codified in uh, 2005 with a, uh, uh, a directive from the Minister of Defense which specified how much people would be paid for anything that contributed to the killing of a guerrilla chief or a guerrilla ground troop or uh, how much they would be paid for computers or hard drives or video cameras or flash drives that uh, belong to illegal armed groups. And <coughs> soldiers in the field were being uh, given time off or they were being given payment or other kinds of perks um, in order to produce deaths. So this man, John Kirama, denounced that there had been 22 of these killings that had been committed by his battalion, most of them civilians who were told that there would be work somewhere, and then they would be brought somewhere and executed by the army, and then put in a uniform or put a gun next to them, and then counted as guerrillas killed in combat. And that battalion received U.S. assistance in 2007 and 2008. In 2009, uh, and 2008 and 9, and then this past year, they were approved for assistance again. And this is relevant because, you know, Plan Colombia started as a democratic plan. It started under Clinton. In, in Clinton's post Monica phase, he was looking for a way to please the, the drug war lobby. And so it's bipartisan. 